ông cứ chọc ông chúng tôi chụp đẹp bạc cả mình to cái trong đại ca này thì sao mà cả nâng đào bị cái chuyện từ xã ra đây nhá nằm bay miền đông cả mình to cái vừa đi dân than to mình chọc được bạc luôn xôm chừng Thank you, Mr. President. When I finished, I had mentioned that intent can be proven by showing knowledge of ongoing crimes or a system of mistreatment and continued participation by the accused. But in this case, we have, in addition to that, we have evidence of positive acts in which these two accused participated. Two examples come to my mind which I think were very important in the history of what happened and in the suffering that occurred throughout the country for four years. The first was the very public threat which was uh, the accused participated in, decided on and participated in, to kill the so-called seven traitors. And we know that this was very well publicized and broadcast, and we know it was carried out to the extent that these individuals could be located and Longbore and Prince Sirik Matap were killed after the fall of Phnom Penh, and that other high-ranking officials from the Longno regime, regime were called to the Ministry of Information and disappeared. This killing of these high officials set an example, a very important example to the cadres, to the troops, many of them young, many of them just teenagers, around Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, and throughout the country, an example that they soon would follow. And second, the event of the forcible transfer of Phnom Penh's population, the forcible expulsion of the entire population of a city of over two million people, an act of such ruthless inhumanity that really is without precedent. People who had lived their entire lives in Phnom Penh were forced to leave their homes with little or no notice, going to unknown destinations, often spending weeks on the road in April in the sun, without provisions. This was an act which could only show to the cadres to these young soldiers, the complete indifference, the antipathy, the hatred of the regime towards the people of the cities, the people of Phnom Penh, these people that were under suspicion of being potential enemies of the state. My colleagues from the civil parties touched on this transfer, but we know children were forced into this inhumane transfer Pregnant women who were about to give birth were thrown out of hospitals. The sick, including hospital patients, were forced to immediately leave. And the elderly, the oldest individuals, there were no exceptions. Can you imagine elderly persons such as Mr. Q. Sampan and Nunchia today being expelled from a city put on a road for weeks to walk and provide for themselves. That would be an act of such obvious and clear inhumanity. The message to the cadres, to the soldiers of the Khmer Rouge was absolutely clear that these people, these victims, their rights didn't matter. Only the regime, Ankar, the power, maintaining their power and their ideology, that is what mattered. The individuals would be sacrificed. That message was heard by these cadres. We saw 
photographs of some of the troops that entered into Phnom Penh. And you could see that many of them were teenagers. They clearly were people, boys from rural villages, many uneducated, and they followed the example that was set. I have been told that there is a saying in Khmer, the back foot follows the front foot which I understand to me that children follow their parents, that subordinates follow their superiors. And this is exactly what happened in the case of the Khmer Rouge. The front foot was the leadership, the very top leadership, including Nun Chia and Q Sam Pan, who set this example, made it absolutely clear how the people should be treated. No exceptions, no humanity. Throw everyone out of the city immediately, regardless of their situation, regardless of whether it was obvious their lives were at risk, regardless of whether you knew they were going to die, throw them out of the city. It's the law of Anka, the decision of Anka. And what does the Nun Shia defense say about that? Well, Nun Shia wasn't head of the Red Cross, so he doesn't have to worry about the inhumanity. He doesn't have to worry about humanitarian concerns. He admits he's responsible for this transfer, but they argue he doesn't have to worry about it because he wasn't head of the Red Cross. So all those deaths and suffering were not his concern. Fortunately, international law does not so hold. Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention provides that even in situations where evacuations of an area are permitted because of the security of the population, it's at risk or imperative military reasons. The people must be transferred back to their homes as soon as hostilities in the area have ceased. Phnom Penh, 17 April, basically hostilities had ceased. And further, it provides in the third paragraph that it's the obligation that you have to ensure, the leaders have to ensure to the greatest practical extent that, pra that excuse me, proper accommodation is provided to receive the protected persons, that the removals are effected in satisfactory conditions of hygiene, health, safety, and nutrition, and that members of the same family are not separated. None of those, none of those concerns were addressed by Nun Chia Q. San Pan, the leaders of the Democratic Camp of Chia. This principle was also recognized in a case at the special panels for serious crimes in the judgment on Zhao Sarmiento on 12 August 2003, paragraph 99, the court held if civilians have to be moved for either of these two reasons, safety or military imperatives, their evacuations are to be under protected, hygienic and humane conditions and as short-lived as possible. None of that took place in the evacuations of Phnom Penh, the cities on the 17th of April or in the second force transfer. And these policies set an absolutely clear message to the cadres, those overseeing the populations in the cooperatives, in the security centers, throughout the country, that individuals did not matter, that they had no rights, that their lives could be put at risk and that this is how the leadership intended to treat the population of Cambodia. One thing that's important to keep in mind in discussing joint criminal enterprise that distinguishes it from all other of the modes of participation under international criminal law is that the contribution of the accused, which in joint criminal enterprise need only be significant, the law says it doesn't have to be substantial, such as in aiding and abetting and in other forms of responsibility. But my main point here is the contribution doesn't even have to be to the specific crime. 
It has to be to the enterprise. So as long as the accused has the intent, shares the intent of the joint criminal enterprise that crimes be committed, any significant contribution to the enterprise will make them responsible for all of the crimes that fall within that joint criminal enterprise, even if they didn't make a specific contribution to that individual crime. Specifically, that would mean, for example, under joint criminal enterprise, an accused could make a where there's an agreement to forcibly transfer population and kill people. The accused can make a contribution to the forcible transfer, perhaps providing trucks, without actually making a contribution to the killing, but still be held responsible for the killing because it was within the joint criminal enterprise. Uh, an example of that principle is found in the Stockage Appeal Judgment, paragraph 64 where the court held this participation need not involve the commission of a specific crime under one of the provisions, but may take the form of assistance in or contribution to the execution of the criminal purpose. But in fact, we have argued in our submissions, uh, both uh, orally and in our written submissions, that these accused did make contributions to all of the crimes that are the specific subject of case 0201. I'm not going to cover all of those. My, my colleagues may touch on some of those. But I just want to briefly mention a few facts. It's apparent. The defense in this case is that one accused says he's too intellectual to contribute to their crimes, and the other accused says, I'm not intellectual enough to contribute to the crimes. In fact, the level of intellect does not preclude one way or the other a person contributing to crimes. The defense arguments that I listened to over the last four days of court hearings, I found to be full of admissions and acknowledgments of the contribution of Kyu Sampan and Nun Chia to this criminal enterprise. The defense's own arguments show the unique and substantial role that each of these accused play in the enterprise. Nun Chia, in the, on the 22nd of October, around 9.30 in the morning, his team acknowledged he concedes he was the deputy secretary of the DPK. He concedes that he agreed with and participated in the expulsion of the population of Phnom Penh. He conceded he agreed with the decision on the execution of the super traitors and his knowledge of the decision to execute So Pim. And they said later in the afternoon, around 1.30, he disseminated political and strategic lines to cadres throughout the party. He also participated over time in the development of CPK policy as a senior leading leader of the party. Indeed, on several occasions, the defense of Nunchia conceded he was, quote, second in command, unquote. His contributions to this criminal enterprise are clear. Q Sampan's contributions are at least equally clear, and I believe even more unique. His counsel made a uh, very good and detailed argument regarding the reputation of Q San Pan before the time of Democratic Council Chia. And, Your Honors, we don't dispute most or very, very little of what counsel said. There is without doubt it was true. Q San Pan was a well-known figure. He had a popularity. He had a uh, clean image. He was believed to be against cooperation, uh, excuse me, corruption. 
against corruption. And that is exactly, and he had worked with the king. He had been a minister under uh, King Suyanuk. So this is exactly the unique contribution that Q. Sampan brought to the Khmer Rouge and Democratic Kampuchea, which they took great advantage of and the role that he played with great enthusiasm as the public face of the Khmer Rouge. The smiling face, the man with the image well known before for being clean, who now stood and smiled and represented this revolution while all the time behind him the killing, the torture, the starvation was going on. But he represented to both the Cambodian people to the international community, to what the defense called the friendly countries towards the democratic Kampuchea regime, even to the king. He represented, oh, this is Q. Sampan. We all know Q. Sampan is a gentle man with a clean image. It's true, that was his reputation, but the exact opposite was what was happening behind him. Behind him was S-21. Behind him were the cooperatives where the people were being enslaved. Behind him were the death and destruction of the society of Cambodia. Your Honor, I mentioned that the closing order makes clear, and, and we also agree that all of the crimes charged in the closing order, in this case, were intended by the accused, and all were within the joint criminal enterprise. But we have stressed enslavement. And this is a word that the defense spent some time, both teams, mocking. Defense lawyers who, uh, like me, had, have never experienced the kind of regime that existed in democratic Cambodia. You've never experienced what these people experienced <coughs> who understand what enslavement meant. <clears throat> Legally, in international law, <coughs> me. enslavement has a precise meaning. And the ICC Elements of Crimes provides that when the perpetrator exercises the powers attaching to the rights of ownership over a human being, or imposes similar deprivations of liberty, including exacting forced labor or otherwise reducing a person to servile status. This amounts to enslavement. And my colleague from the civil parties, Ms. Nguyen, very eloquently, better than I could, described the deprivation of the most fundamental rights of the people of Kampuchea during the time of the Khmer Rouge regime. They couldn't even eat with their families at times. Every aspect of where they lived, where they worked, was controlled down to whether they would live or die. That was a, a right that Angkor could take away at any time and without any legal process or any reason. Your Honours, the defense has tried to say that this enslavement was an invention of experts for the prosecution, but that's not true. Describing the condition of slavery is something that the victims did. In E3-3346, Hang Niao, it's a book, but it quotes Hang Niao. He, of course, is now deceased. It describes how he heard a nurse ask someone if they had, quote, fed the slave, the war slaves yet. And Hang Niao said, it was a chance remark, but it stuck in my ears because it explained the Khmer Rouge better than anything else. The Khmer Rouge had beaten us in the Civil War. We were their war slaves. In E3-4590, 
it states that one officer's wife had to work for the wives of some Khmer Rouge and that they called her slave. In E3-4202, behind the killing fields, it talks about Tet Sambat, and it said Sambat did not understand who the Khmer Rouge were when the group came to power. He just knew that people were starving and forced to work like slaves. In the civil party application E3-5736, Cheng Eng Li said that she was expelled and forced to go to a destination 60 kilometers outside Phnom Penh, which the Khmer Rouge had randomly chosen. And then she said she had no energy left because of, quote, things like the more than 16 hours a day of slave labor imposed by the Khmer Rouge. She talked about hunger, parasites, and health problems. And she said, finally, it is therefore easy to see why life under these conditions was just outright slavery. Civil Party E3-4677 said, when I think about the Khmer Rouge era, it reminds me of being forced to work like a slave both day and night. There were no freedoms at all, and they killed as they pleased. And in the application of Civil Party E3-5108, he said, some of the Khmer Rouge former soldiers were settled by Anka, and now we became their slave workers. E3-5663 said, I grew rice and did what they had me do, generally speaking, like their slave. This treating treatment of human beings as simple assets to be weighed, whether they're benefits or debits, and then to be done away with, runs through much of the testimony and the evidence in this case. Doik, in his statement, which if I, I believe it should be quoted, E4590020439, he said at one point, Sun Sen, and perhaps other Khmer Rouge leaders as well, used a phrase, no gain in keeping, no loss in weeding out. The same phrase appears in E3-2812, a book by Henri Lacard about sayings during the Pol Pot era, and he said about that phrase, this slogan is one of the most well-known countrywide during the days of the Khmer Rouge rule, and it really does summarize the essence of the enslavement and the policies and the joint criminal enterprise that existed. The Khmer Rouge had an ideology. They wanted a great Cambodia, and they wanted to preserve their revolution and their own positions and privilege. But their idea of helping Cambodia did not include helping Cambodians. Cambodians were merely pawns. Gain, there was a gain in keeping, but there's no loss in weeding out. They were treated as something that was owned. And that is why we believe that all of the crimes in the in closing order, in the indictments, from the persecutions, from the um, forced marriages, from the torture, from the killing, all of these are really part and parcel of an overall attitude that in our view is best described as enslavement. The people of Cambodia, the Cambodian people outside of the top leadership maintaining their own privileges, were simply assets who had no rights other than those that they chose to give. 
who could live or die according to the wishes of the leadership of the Khmer Rouge. E3 4838. This is the last testimony or civil party application I will address. Said, she said that she was living in Takyao. She said, I worked there like a slave. We never had enough food. The Khmer Rouge ordered me to start work just two months after I had just delivered my child. They told me if I did not work and just ate food produced by working people, I would be removed. And we all know what the Khmer Rouge meant by me being removed. Even Q Sam Pan himself acknowledged that people on the cooperatives were not free. He himself acknowledged the basic condition of slavery. Honor, I, I want to end by talking about a couple other statements. Generally, a person's intent in most criminal cases is shown by their actions by what was going on in their knowledge. But sometimes, even when they choose their words very carefully, you can get some insight into their real intent. Nun Chia, we know, had these long interviews with Tet Sambet. In fact, he said at one point, he told uh, Tet Sambet that he had to weigh his words very carefully because my future depends on what is recorded here. But at one point, he was asked about these killings and he said, quote, I have feelings for both the nation and the individual, but I clearly distinguish between them. If we must choose one or the other, I choose the nation. And Nun Chia then said, the individual I cast aside. That is exactly summarizes the policies of the Khmer Rouge. The individual, the individual is the Cambodian people. The individual he cast aside. Only the leadership of Angkor mattered. Q Sam Khan, both of these men, by the way, are obviously highly intelligent. There's no question about that. I don't know what the defense is trying to say that we've painted images of them are not, that are not true. This is part of their legal and moral responsibility. These are highly intelligent people and very politically astute. Q Sampan gave an interview to journalists who were asking him about S-21. And at one point, they started pushing him about the killings at S-21 and the fact that even some of the killers were themselves children. And finally, the interviewer asked Q Sampan, but what can make a 10-year-old child kill other children? Q Sampan's answer, Without Pol Pot, without the Khmer Rouge, Cambodia would have been in the hands of the Vietnamese. And he, then he added, so they talk about the little S-21 here to make people forget. The defense will have a chance to reply to our arguments, and your honors, I hope they will explain what to me, and I think to most of the people in the world, is inexplicable. How does killing Cambodian children save Cambodia from Vietnam? How do you justify the murder of children by saying that saves the country from Vietnam? And this kind of logic of the defense, this very troubling logic, carried over even into the defense arguments the very articulate arguments of defense counsel. And defense counsel for Nun Chia said at least twice, brought up the point, they said, all of Pol Pot's paranoia came to pass. It came to pass exactly the way he feared it might. So what is their point? The Khmer Rouge suspected everyone in Cambodia, intellectual, city people, eventually even into their own ranks. Everyone fell under suspicion of potential enemies. So what they did is they enslaved, they tortured, and they killed them. And the defense answer is, well, see, they were overthrown. They were invaded and overthrown. So therefore, they were right. So what is the logic of that? They should have killed more? 
men lau zai mai killed everyone no one could have overthrown them this is the kind of twisted logic that must be rejected in this case the evidence in this case shows a common criminal enterprise a joint criminal enterprise all of the crime of the uh, crimes charged were included within that and it's, in, it's best described in our view as a system of mistreatment where the leadership treated the people of Sierra Leone of Cambodia as slaves thank you Mr. President, Your Honours, good morning. I will be addressing you on the crimes and the policies. I may not have time to cover everything I'm anticipating to cover, but can I start, please? with some points of law. And I'd like to start with this evidential distinction between evidence you have heard in this case and assertions or suggestions made by the defense. You are masters of the evidence. The evidence in the case is your guide. And only the evidence matters. And why this is important is because you have been bombarded with a raft of suggestions and assertions in closing briefs, particularly by Nguyen Chia. Let me make it absolutely plain in our submission. What Nguyen Chia's counsel says his belief was is not evidence. What Nguyen Chia says was going through his team say was going through his mind is not evidence. It is assertion. It is suggestion. It is not evidence, and you can disregard it from the outset. I want to deal with some law on the first forced transfer. I hope that your senior legal officer will have already researched in detail submissions put forward in filings in January this year, nine months ago. Filings about the applicable law on forced transfer. I anticipate your senior legal officer has already tasked others to research the submissions put forward, but I want to make it absolutely plain what our submission is. We submit that the prosecution has proved the following seven features. First, that the forced transfer of Phnom Penh constituted or was part of a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population and both accused knew this. Secondly, that the victims were forced to leave places where they lawfully resided. Thirdly, that the victims endured great suffering or serious mental or physical suffering or injury. Fourthly, that the forced transfer of Phnom Penh took place with threats, force and coercion. Fifthly, that these accused both intended that their victims would leave their homes. In other words, there was an intention to displace. Sixth, that both accused participated in the forced transfer meetings before April 1975 and knew that the forced transfer of Phnom Penh was inevitably going to cause serious physical or mental suffering. Now those first six contentions, I hope, will not trouble you, the judges, very much. The evidence is clear. But I want to make submissions now about the seventh point. The prosecution have proved that the forced transfer took place without grounds permitted under international law, such as the safety or security of the population or 
for imperative military reasons. Now, Mr. President, to your honours, you have heard hours worth of evidence about humanitarian crises, food, bombing, and other such matters. Can I make our submission absolutely clear? These defence teams cannot, as a matter of law, rely on prohibited grounds. Now, had you determined this as a matter of law before the closing speeches, then hours of submissions could not have been put forward. I make it plain, these accused cannot rely on permitted grounds, and the reason has already been expressed by my learned colleague, Mr. Kumjan, but I want to make our submission absolutely plain. If, as an accused, you do not allow the target population in a forced transfer to return home, you cannot, as a matter of law, rely on permitted grounds. It's not available at law. These forced transfers were not humane and short-lived. No attempts were ever made by the Khmer Rouge to return all the victims. And the party centre even announced that the steps that they had taken were permanent. Now, all that the defence have done so far is made some submissions in a filing in January, and I invite them to respond when they have their time. Respond to this argument. Now, even, Mr. President and Your Honours, if you were to take the wholly exceptional step going against decided international law that these accused were somehow permitted to rely on permitted grounds, their defences would still fail, and they would fail for these reasons. When dealing with forced transfer, you have to ask effectively three questions, and the first is this. The first question, on an objective analysis of the facts, as disclosed by the evidence, did the situation in Phnom Penh on the 17th of April, in fact, justify forced transfer on such a massive scale? The objective element of the test, and my submission is absolutely plain. On an objective analysis, the defence fails at this hurdle. Secondly, you have to ask yourself, will what evidence have we as the judges heard to show that these accused on the 17th of April 1975 acted in an honest conviction that what they were doing by forcibly transferring millions of people was legally justifiable? Well, where's the evidence of what Nguyen Chia believed? There is none, because he has refused to continue to testify on this point. He hasn't come before you, Mr. President and Your Honours, to say what his honest beliefs were. Uh, and there's and no other evidence on the case file being put forward sensibly to explain what his honest beliefs are. And what his lawyers say in a closing brief is not evidence. It is assertion. It's inadmissible. It's not evidence in the case. And then when you look at this area of committed grounds, you have to look at the nature and the scale of this forced transfer. It's of millions of people in the most inhumane conditions at gunpoint, at short notice, without exception. So the defence fails, firstly, because they're deprived of arguing permitted grounds. Secondly, it fails that even if you thought they were, on an objective analysis, the circumstances do not fit that exception. And thirdly, you have no evidence whatsoever as to what their honest convictions were on the 17th of April 1975. They, Mr. President, Your Honours, are claiming necessity as an afterthought. 
on the basis of hindsight without citing any evidence. There was nothing humanitarian whatsoever about the first force transfer. And their defence fails yet again, because if an abused person has significantly contributed to the conditions, or the conditions are a result of their activity, they can't rely on permitted grounds. And the best we get from Nunchia is this. Well, it was my economic policy. This is the theory shared by the Khmer Rouge apologists that all deaths are down to the monumentally misguided, incompetent plan of arrogant fools who were just too inept to get things right. That is not the reality. Some may wish it was to give them comfort to explain away deaths on such a monumental scale, but the evidence dictates otherwise. It was criminal, not humanitarian. The accused always intended the crime of forced transfer. The accused implemented the crime of forced transfer. The crime of forced transfer was the result. The intention and the outcome go hand in hand. Why didn't Nguyen Chia, if he's relying on this economic belief, come into the witness box or sit where he is and give evidence about it and be cross-examined by expert prosecution lawyers? And then, no, we won't testify about it. We'll just run this assertion in our closing brief, unsupported by any evidence whatsoever. But it was my economic policy. They have the temerity to say that the policy program was not unusual or unreasonable and certainly not unlawful. It was unlawful. The forced transfer was criminal. It was always going to be implemented through the crime of forced labour in inhumane conditions by people owned by Anka. I'm sorry you've got to die. It's all economic. I'm sorry I'm executing you. It's all economic. For good measure, I need to persecute you. It's my economic program. I'm going to strip you of all your rights, enslave you and imprison you, tell you where to live and separate from you from your family. It's all economic. I'm going to starve you and force you to work 15 hours a day. It's all economic. It's for the good of the nation. How dare Nguyen Chia assert and tell the victims of these deaths that this was for the good of the nation. And then we come to what, leader, what did these leaders ever advance as to the reasons for the forced transfer? Pol Pot, smashing all sorts of enemy organisations. Nguyen Chia, we smashed the plan. We evacuated the cities. The CIA and other agents left there for the countryside. Hu Song Phong, there was incitement by the CIA more rebels, remnants of the Lon Nol army. And then even Ying Siri, when he's being asked about the reasons, talks disingenuously about having to transfer food, uh, move people from the capital to the food. And then even he with other journalists, no mention of this grand economic policy. 14th of June 1978, he tells journalists malaria was the reason for the evacuation of Phnom Penh. And on the 29th of July in the same year, it was necessary because otherwise we would have a civil war.
Where's all the talk of the economic policy by these fellow senior leaders? And then Nguyen Chia say, well, hang on, what about the dams in India? Because, I mean, in the 1970s, the World Bank was doing some work with dam construction in India. Mr. President, Your Honours, the World Bank did not fund forced transfer at gunpoint, the shooting of those who refused to move, the use of a coordinated military force, the imposition of inhumane conditions, executions, enslavement and forced labour in providing financial assistance to dams in India. There was no compensation here for the victims of the force transfer in Chongpeng, and there was no attempt, obviously, whatsoever at humanitarian resettlement. I want to deal very quickly with humanitarian issues, food bombing and the like. You know from our closing brief that our legal submission is that the CPK leadership deliberately caused or significantly contributed to the humanitarian crisis. That was by placing the city under siege, forcing people to flee, blocking the delivery of food, shelling the city indiscriminately. You know the evidence of indiscriminate shelling for months, the destroying of delivery ships, the shelling of the airport, the rejection of all offers of international aid. On the bombing, Q Sampan still wants to rely on this. But can I pause on the bombing for one moment? Because Nguyen Chia's defence have turned turtle, as we say, on this. First of all, having a case strategy where bombing was relevant and pursued in lines of questioning. But then the true nature comes out again in these clothing briefs. We were going to evacuate anyway. In other words, we don't care about any other factors. We don't care about the humanitarian situation or the food or the bombing. We were going to evacuate anyway. Causes real problems for the Q Son Pon team because they still want to argue that these are relevant. Mr. President, Your Honours, the evidence shows that as a matter of fact there was no such risk of bombing. And in any event, there's no evidence that an honest conviction was held by Q Son Pon or Nguyen Chia that such bombing would in fact occur. As Francois Ponchot said, even the Khmer Rouge did not believe there would be bombing. The bombing had ceased on the 15th of August 1973. With the food situation, can I simply say this? Direct evidence from witnesses, Francois Ponchot talked about there being two months reserves of rice because he and the agencies were concerned that the Khmer Rouge would cut off the Mekong. Why not use all the resources in the city? Why not gather up the existing supplies? Why not allow supplies to come in down the river? And how was it helping the country to reject all aid? You'll have in mind Sidney Schomburg's testimony that it was easier to feed a stable population than a moving one. This was not a humanitarian effort with food. Phnom Penh was still well served by river, road and air. The food argument is again hypothesis after the event. Mr. President, I don't propose to deal with military reasons or medical reasons. I refer you to our filing on the subject. I want to move now to the second force transfer. You have our arguments that this was centrally devised, that it was supported by the visit to uh, the northwest zone by the Standing Committee, and everything has been set out in terms of this being a centrally devised policy. 
But I want to examine this from a slightly different angle. The defence seek to assert that this was the rogue activity of some zone commanders. And let's just dwell on this and see whether there's any sense whatsoever in this assertion. Because what it relies on is that secretly, without the knowledge of the party centre, two or more zone commanders get together and decide that they're going to forcibly transfer hundreds of thousands of people up to the north and northwest zones without the party centre knowing anything about it because this is a rogue organisation. It's a ludicrous assertion. It would have involved taking thousands of people through Phnom Penh, recruiting CPK Park cadre at Phnom Penh railway station to operate the railway trucks without the centre's permission and transfer all these people to the northwest zone without the party centre knowing. Your Honours, these transfers didn't all take place in the middle of the night, in the dark cloak of secrecy. And then it's not even just the railways. I don't know if you remember the testimony of a witness, Kuch Pandarasa. She was the lady who said that she'd been taken on a motorboat with hundreds of families towards Phnom Penh as part of the second force transfer. Where did the motorboat stop? It stopped in the middle of Phnom Penh outside the royal palace. It's not a very clever place to stop if you're trying to keep things secret from the party centre. And then, do you remember her evidence to this extent? That when this boat got to Phnom Penh, one of the men on the boat, one of the transferees, shouted, Bravo! We're in Phnom Penh, right outside the royal palace. And Khmer Rouge soldiers shot him and threw him in the river. So, we're doing this secret, unauthorised transfer, and we'll take a boatload of hundreds of families right outside the Royal Palace, and we'll bring attention to ourselves by shooting somebody. It's a, it's a ridiculous assertion, and it becomes more ridiculous when you look at the railways. You will recall that the Khmer Rouge had to train or use certain railwaymen that had been used uh, in the Khmer Republic. But the second force transfer, Your Honours, involved the extensive and repeated use of the railway system to transfer thousands of people to the north. It was a highly organised operation. It involved trained railway workers working under the control of responsible sector militia. It involved Khmer Rouge armed guards, a telecommunications network and the use of vehicles for onward transfer. You may recall the testimony of Sok Chin, one of the railway workers, and he said that in his sector, this movement was coordinated by a sector military chief who reported directly to the train unit in Phnom Penh. And then again, Sok Chin and other witnesses, that as part of the second force transfer, transferees had to provide their biographies. If this is a rogue operation, why have we got all this central organisation, contact with central people in Phnom Penh, a telecommunications network with Phnom Penh? It just goes again to underline how thin this argument is that the second force transfer was a rogue operation. I want to move to Tulpul Trey, and I want to say this immediately. The way the defence have submitted their case on Tulpul Trey, you'd think that nobody in the history of criminal cases had ever been convicted of murder where there wasn't a witness to the murder. 
Mr. President, I've dealt with dozens of murder cases where there's no witness to the murder. It's a common feature of murder cases that there's no witness to the murder. And when there isn't, you have to look to the other evidence and assess it for its reliability. Now, Torpal Trey amounts in my submission to this. An order was given by the Zone Committee to kill Lon Nol soldiers and police. You've got a direct order. Secondly, an order was given that the location of the killings was Tall Pol Trey. An order, the victim, the location. And then you have a meeting, as you know, taking place in the Provincial Hall, attended by senior officers of the Khmer Rouge. You've got the attendees to the meeting. You then have many Khmer Republic officials, including officers, being transported by truck to that meeting and the very same trucks taking them all the way to Tool Pool Trey. And the defence can try and discredit Lim Sat, but this is what his evidence amounted to. He saw, with his own eyes, 30 to 40 military and civilian trucks taking Long Nol soldiers to the meeting place at the provincial hall. He saw 15 of those trucks transporting Khmer Republic soldiers and officials to Tool Pul Trey. He was informed via radio that the soldiers and police had been taken to Tool Pul Trey and killed. He heard gunshots in the background during the radio communication with the CPK soldiers and and then the trucks come back on the same road and they're empty and after some trucks had left he's ordered by radio to release more trucks to go to the killing site. I just want to talk about the radio communication. He said, people at Tool Pool Trey Force communicated through radio communication to us asking that more truckloads of soldiers and police had to be transported there. My commander was talking on the radio communication and I heard this. Mr. President, Your Honours, this is nothing unusual in a murder case. You're looking at the, who were the victims, what was the order, where's the location for the killing, and what absolutely contemporaneous, reliable, Incredible hearsay evidence do we have. It's over the radio. We've killed them at this site. It's over the radio. Send more truckloads now. This is reliable hearsay. This is credible hearsay. If hearsay is good quality, you put it in your judicial backpack and you use it, especially if it's consistent, especially if it corroborates other evidence. And then the defence say, well, nobody's come forward to say, particularly by way of testimony, what happened with dead bodies. TCW 644 went to the execution site the day after and saw bodies with gunshot wounds to the head and torso. The victims were tied together by rope with their hands tied behind their back. Ong Chat, he was told by villagers, you'll remember this is the day, the day of the killing, or the day after perhaps. He's told by villagers that the corpses were bound at the arms and tied in groups of 15 to 20. 
And then you remember the Kadra on the video. When they got off the truck, they were told their arms would be tied because they were meeting the prince. And after being tied up, they were taken to the bank, to the pond, and killed. The farmer, the old one on the video, stating that he went the morning afterwards. And he saw the bodies, describing them as stiff, with the sound of decomposition coming from them. Quote, bubbling like molten tarmac. Well, you're going to have to determine, Your Honours. My submission to you is plain. On the testimony you heard, Lim Sat, Ung Chat, Ung Chat, Samaluk. On that testimony, you can convict. In other words, you don't need to go any further. Convict because it's reliable evidence in its own right. But we've still got this evidential conundrum to determine. What is the evidential status of the video? You've admitted the video. The video is on the case file. It hasn't been subject to cross-examination. It's still probative evidence. It's still evidence available to you. And to the extent that the evidence contained in that video is consistent and corroborates other evidence, it in itself is reliable evidence. And I make no apology for this. The defence have done a good job trying to deconstruct this evidence, but this evidence, Your Honours, is enough to convict. One point about inconsistencies. My learned friend, Mr. Verkan, thinks it's important that you didn't receive evidence of the model of the car that was used that turned up at the hall, or the colour of the trucks that were used to take the victims to their deaths. That is not evidence that will trouble you. You'll look to the main evidence at Tulpul Tray, not evidence about trucks or colours of cars or exactly how many people were at a meeting. There were truckloads and truckloads were killed. I want to move on a little bit to the underlying policy because you know our case is that Tulpul Tray is but one example of a whole policy. And I want to start with one piece of evidence and it's the photograph taken by Al Rokoff at the Ministry of Information at 4 o'clock on the 17th of April 1975. The piece of evidence that neither of these defence teams have said anything about. Why? Because a picture never lies. That picture in itself is potent and compelling evidence of a policy. In itself, just that one photograph, the man in black, 35 years old, clearly a leader, dividing the groups into military, political and ordinary civilians, the guns being trained on them, Schamberg, not surprising Schamberg said this about the people in that photograph, on the left-hand side of the photograph, in their civilian clothes and their ties, stood in front of the Khmer Rouge leader. They were clearly frightened, and I think most of them knew they were going to be killed. Very strong evidence. And then Schomburg's testimony, proving the link between that man in black and the leadership. Do you remember Lomnov's um, relation coming forward and saying, can I leave the country, please? 
And one of the Khmer Rouge leaders says, it will depend on the government. They make the regulations. Some of the top political and governmental leaders are not far from the city. That, Mr. President, Your Honours, is evidence of policy. That is evidence of a centralised link between that man in black on the photograph and the leadership which he represented. You then add to that the massive policy of killings of Khmer Rouge officials in and outside Phnom Penh. You add to that the list of the generals executed, Chim Chuan, seen by Schaumburg, executed, he's on the list. General Tach Sari, the one who went to the ministry, and we know this from his cousin, executed, on the list. General Amrong, executed on the list. And then another piece of evidence the defence say nothing about, the link between Pin and Doik. Now, I'm sure you have this, Your Honours. Pin's the man who made the order, the military order. They want to call him a soldier. He's not a soldier. He's the commander of Division 703. And what does Doik say that Pin told him? Because Doik and Pin knew each other, and they knew each other well. Pin tells Doik, and this is Doik's version, I quote, I know that after the 17th of April, soldiers were systematically eliminated. This was confirmed to me by Kum Pin, the Secretary of Division 703. What did the defence say about this? Absolutely nothing. Respond if you want to when you get your time. Tell us what your approach is to this evidence, because we don't know. Systematically eliminated. Another general, Deng Yalom, executed on the list. Pin's order itself is compelling evidence. And the best the defence can come up with is, oh, there's one name on that list who's a teacher who was executed for supporting the Khmer Republic. And I want to finish, Mr. President, this brief part. I'm going to continue after lunch very briefly. But I want, and Judge Laverne, I ask you in particular, please, to listen to the next submissions. Because I'm going to quote to you what Doik said in case one. E3-5793. It was talking about Takmao Prison. Takmao Prison. It had been a psychiatric hospital. It was MO3, or the police officers of Division 703. And please, Your Honours, have regard to this evidence in the context of the defence assertion that there's not a centralised policy to kill Khmer Republic officials on the 17th of April, 18th, 19th. Doik, case one. Tak Mao was liberated on the 17th of April 1975. The prison, it was created about two to three days after liberation. And there was a military unit assigned to the prison two to three days after liberation and quote about this military unit. Their only role is to erase the former officials of Lon Nol for smashing. Close quote. Let me just say this. You take the photograph and you take that evidence I've just given you. There's more, but you take those two pieces of evidence and you've got concrete evidence of a policy. Concrete evidence of a policy.
E3 slash 5795, still doik. Case 1. The purges of the former regime soldiers and officers, the public servants, was carried out from the 17th of April forwards until the full cooperation of S21 in October. More evidence of a centralised policy. E3 slash 5795. Nine five. Doik. Case one. First, S21 was the police office of Division 703. Pins Division. From the beginning, it was the purges period of the former regime officials and police and soldiers of the Lon Nol regime. During that initial stage, people were evacuated and then some of the senior soldiers were arrested and secretly killed. I'd like to cover two other short brief extracts and then I will suggest, please Mr President, that we break. E3 slash 345, Doik, Case 1, Judge Laverne, question. Well, were the people linked to the toppled regime of the Khmer Republic, Lon Nol's regime? Well, I mean, were they re-educated or were they executed? That was your question, Judge Laverne, in case one. The answer from Doi. People in Lon Nol's regime were classified into three categories. First category referred to the people who were smashed secretly. Policy. Centralised policy. And finally, E3 slash 5795, Doi, case one. During the initial stage of the establishment of S21, before I became the chairman, the only target was the former regime officials and soldiers. Now, why this is important, I submit, is it's the plainest evidence of central policy. And it's the plainest evidence of central policy, not in May, not in August, in April. The photograph is the 17th of the April, Tak Mao's two days afterwards, and everything Doig says is in the weeks after. Mr. President, I'm going to pause at that um, point, please. Can I indicate I propose to carry on very briefly after the luncheon break? Thank you. ขอบคุณลูกมาแล้วนี้ดอลเปลสมรักไทยทองให้อันเป็นประกาศสมรักจับประเพณีนี้ <coughs> ส่งมาเชิญชวนวิ่งในมีบรรทอกกิจกรรมการสัมมนาการประกอบ